So it would be something of a failure if we talked about diffraction and didn't mention the double slit experiment and what it means for quantum mechanics. This is really one of the most important and yet simple experiments that's ever been done. It goes to the heart of quantum mechanics where apparently we have to treat everything as a wave and a particle at the same time and it really depends on the kind of experiment that you do as to whether you me measure the wave nature of the universe or the particle nature of the universe. So what are we talking about here? Let's look at an example. In this example what we have is a double slit, so two slits close together in a metal plate. They're separated by a few wavelengths so that when you shine light at these slits on the other side you would see the double slit interference pattern with light. Except in this experiment we're not using a bright laser beam or anything, we're using a single photon source. So there's only ever one photon at a time in the experiment. A single photon travels towards this plate with the double slits in it and then after it passes through this plate it's collected on a CCD camera. So you might imagine the photon has to go through one slit or the other but according to quantum mechanics, the single photon is also a wave, and so it passes through both slits at the same time. And because it's going through both slits, we see an interference pattern. Because the photon, when it passes through the slits, is behaving like a wave, and yet when it's detected on the CCD, it's behaving like a particle. And so what we see here, over time, is this pattern building up, where we see some places where there's more likely a photon to arrive and other places where it's less likely for a photon to arrive. We see, in other words, bright and dark fringes, which is the classic double slit interference pattern. There are places where you might expect it should be perfectly dark and it won't be because the CCD has, has noise. There are some times where you, you think you're measuring a photon but in fact you're measuring detector noise. So the um, visibility of these fringes is not perfect. But nevertheless, you see this strong interference pattern. But it's an interference pattern made because the single photon is passing through both slits at the same time, then interfering with itself on the other side of these slits. So that's fine. You can accept maybe that, that light behaves strangely, but things get even stranger. Because, according to quantum mechanics, massive objects also behave like waves. How so? Well, there's something called a de Broglie wavelength and de Broglie waves. So the de Broglie wavelength of anything is Planck's constant h divided by the momentum of the object that you have. So we can rewrite this as h divided by 2, the square root of 2 times t times m0, where m0 is the rest mass of the object and t is the kinetic energy. So I've just rewritten the momentum here. And that'll be convenient for other um, bits of work we do later on. So if we consider an apple in your pocket while we're walking, what's the wavelength of the apple? Well, it's got a mass of maybe, I don't know, 200 grams, velocity of one meter per second. We plug this into the equation and we get a wavelength of about three by 10 to the minus 33 meters. This is an extremely small wavelength, much, much smaller than the size of an apple. So you, it's not surprising perhaps that we can't see the wave nature of an, atom, of, of an apple because it's just too small a wavelength for us to see. What about a single carbon atom? Well, the mass of a single carbon atom is about 12, which is the number of uh, nucleons, times the atomic mass unit, 1.7 by 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Same velocity if it's carbon atom in your pocket as you're walking. So here's the wavelength, and the wavelength then is about 3 by 10 to the minus 8 meters. Now this is much closer to the wavelength of light, for example. So we should perhaps be able to see interference of single atoms if we fire them through a double slit experiment as long as they're traveling slowly enough, right? So this is quite a slow velocity here, one meter per second. Well, here is a movie for the in showing the interference of large molecules. The molecules here are C32H18N8. That's a lot of atoms. It's got 514 atomic mass units altogether and a velocity of 150 meters per second. So the wavelength of these molecules is going to be very, very small. So we're going to need very small slits and some very sensitive uh, measurement gear to be able to see the interference, but it has been done. So this is a movie showing the interference of single molecules. Now the image, images you'll see here were taken with fluorescence microscopy. So um, all of these bright dots here are seen because you're shining a laser at the screen where the molecules arrive. So the molecules get fired through a screen with some slits in it. And then when they arrive, uh, they hit a plate, a glass plate, and their image using fluorescence microscopy. 
And so again, we see this classic double slit interference pattern, places where there you see lots of molecules and places where you see no molecules, because each molecule as it passes through the plates interferes with itself, and then you have an interference pattern. The final thing I want to discuss in this section is something about electron microscopy. Now we talked about optical microscopy and the diffraction limit, and the diffraction limit comes about because light is a wave. The longer the wavelength of light, the worse the diffraction limit is. If you move to electron microscopy, then what you can achieve is much, much smaller wavelengths. If your electron wave has a smaller wavelength, then the diffraction limit for your electron wave will be much less than for your optical wave. So we need to, just to figure out what the wavelength is for electrons in electron microscope. So here's the equation for the de Broglie wavelength, h on p, where p is the momentum. But if we accelerate our electrons so they're going really, really fast, then we, we've got to consider the relativistic momentum here. So this is the relative, relativistic energy of something with its rest mass and momentum. The kinetic energy we can write as the total energy minus the rest energy. So it looks like this. Solving for, for the momentum, we find momentum given by this equation here. And so the wavelength in terms of the kinetic energy can be written as h on the square root of t squared on c squared plus 2t m naught. So here's an equation for our wavelength in terms of the uh, relativistic kinetic energy. So in order to get the wavelength of electrons in electro electron microscope correct, sometimes you have to use this full relativistic expansion. So for an electron with a, this mass, an electron microscope use a typical acceleration voltage of say 300 kilovolts, the kinetic energy is going to be 300 kilo electron volts. Or writing that out, we have 300 times 1,000 times the charge of an electron in joules is about 4.8 by 10 to the minus 14 joules. Subbing that into our equation, we get a wavelength of about 2.24 picometers without the relativistic correction, or 1.97 picometers with the correction. So you can see it makes a bit of a difference here. And the higher your acceleration voltage, the larger this difference will become. Now the best electron microscopes reach about 47 picometers resolution at 300 kilo, kilo electron volts. So that's about 23 times worse than the electron diffraction limit. So there are things that limit electron microscopy that aren't to do with electron diffraction. And um, here are a couple of very fairly recent papers explaining some of the things that might be going on. It's to do with stray magnetic fields that disturb the path of the electrons. So this is something that people might be able to fix. Anyhow, here's the, st um, the range of standard electron microscopes, ranging from about 1 or up to uh, 300 kilo electron volts. And beyond that, we have what we call high voltage electron microscopes. The blue line shows you the wavelength without the relativistic correction, and the red is the, the relativistic corrected wavelength. So what's interesting here is that the relativistic correction makes the wavelength shorter, which increases, in principle, increases the resolution of your electron microscope because you have a shorter wavelength. So if we can achieve diffraction limited electron microscopy, relativity actually increases the resolution of your electron microscope, which is kind of an interesting result.